Hello and welcome to the society with Fatma Shaheen at PTV World. Dengue as we all know is that one word which we should not as a society take lightly precisely because it impacts countless lives not only in Pakistan but world over. Having said that how precisely does dengue then impact us as a society this is something upon which we will be shedding light today. We will be talking about the disease itself, we will be talking about its preventions, we will also be talking about the fact that why is it so important then to actually ensure that there are timely interventions. And we'll also be talking about the fact that when we do talk about dengue at large, what all has the Pakistani government done with regards to fighting off the same beat in terms of, you know, having requisite policies in place or for that matter, having requisite initiatives. We'll in this regard also be delving upon the fact that, you know, whereas of course at one end we do see the government working uh, so as to, you know, prevent this disease, so as to make people aware about the same too. It's very important then that the community at large does play its respective role too. How can we as a society collectively work towards a dengue free Pakistan? This is something upon which we will be shedding light today. All of this today on the society that too with a very imminent panel. Let me introduce you to my today's panel. My first panelist for today's show is Dr. Wafa Kaiser, who is an internist. She is also the joint secretary of Pakistani Society of Internal Medicine. Assalamualaikum ji and welcome to the show. Walaikum Aslam. Thank you very much for having me You're here. You're most welcome. Alongside her, I have Dr. Yadullah who is the Director of Health Services, CDC and EPC Punjab. Assalamu alaikum sir and welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting yeah. me in the show. You're most welcome. And via telephone line, we'll be joined by Professor Dr. Zarfisha Tahir, who is the Dean of Institute of Public Health. Assalamu alaikum madam and welcome to the show. Thank you. Madam, to start the conversation with you, a very basic question at the very outset that when we do talk about dengue, we understand somebody like yourself who is an expert in this field uh, would have your own unique perspective both about the diagnosis as well as the treatment of this very disease. So in this regard, uh, what are the advancements that have we have made and what are the challenges that we face when it comes to both timely diagnosing and of course treating this disease as well? I have said that, we, that the viral antigen in the form of NS1 and the serological detection which is IgM and IgG antibodies which they are based on capture based immunoglobulin ELISA and which is the new standard nowadays and that is also a dif this also differentiates between primary and secondary infection. Secondary infection meaning someone who gets the infection again. Now this is a very sensitive and reliable tool uh, technique and it's also internationally recommended and in Pakistan we are following the same. Right, madam. On which I'll come to you, Wafa, and I would want you to add your own internist narrative to this too. So, when we talk about timely making that diagnosis, how early is it that we typically see the symptoms surfacing? Because at least in other viral diseases, like we saw in the time of COVID-19, there was some time before the virus actually uh, surfaced so as to actually show symptoms. So, what is that incubation period in between? So, Fatma, when we talk about dengue, it's also, we all know much about mm. it as well, and yet so much more we have to still you know research about it mm. but as far as the incubation period is concerned as we all know that it spreads or it starts the disease starts with the bite of a mosquito mm. so uh, research has shown it takes about 3 to 14 days mm. after the virus has entered the body mm. to sort of you know start a whole reaction which is called an immune reaction and for the viremia to spread where the virus multiplicates in the body and first few symptoms that come hmm. it takes about two weeks for that it takes about two yeah. weeks basically but in this regard when we talk about timely diagnosing the disease uh, do you not feel then here that the stage at which dengue has reached will actually dictate the kind of test which will be used for the diagnosis because we do understand that the disease comes in various stages which yeah. of course in turn impacts the way it is diagnosed as well yeah. You're absolutely correct over there. So the first phase that we talk about is the viremic phase or the febrile phase. Mm. In the febrile phase, unfortunately, there is not much clinically or symptomatic wise that can differentiate a dengue fever from any other viral mm. illness because it comes with fever, high grade, mm. comes with a lot of bone breaking pain, retroorbital mm. head, uh, pain and headaches and myalgias, which is also similar to a lot of other uh, exactly. viral infections. So it would be so confusing that way. Yeah, but the thing is that since we know and there's public awareness that uh, dengue is happening during this monsoon season mm. or it's got the specific time, everybody is sort of made aware of the fact that anybody who comes with a high fever, we recommend them to take a simple blood test, which right. is called as a complete blood mm. count. Mm. And that would, so 
first thing first when you when a patient presents with fever and mm. such symptoms of myalgias arthralgias we label it as a suspected kind of a dengue because mm. you start thinking about dengue when a patient is presenting right. with such but then the symptoms in themselves they could possibly be confused with you yeah. know typhoid or malaria too yeah right. and the first thing that we do f uh, go for is a complete blood count and the right. complete blood count would actually point or just give a give us a hint towards the right. patient having a viral infection because it has a very specific impact on the cell counts mm. so the white cell count uh, also known as the tlc that mm. drops mm. and also the platelets responsible those are small mm. particles that are responsible for clotting of the blood mm. so the platelets uh, we see a fall in the platelets mm. too so any patient uh, in medical terms it is called as a bicytopenia where okay. two cell lines are reduced right and then when we see that the two cell lines are reduced mm. depending on which day of fever it is then mm. we recommend tests right so at the end then it would also be determinative of what stage the dengue is supposedly yeah, reached absolutely. so around which i'll come to you understand you've been working very diligently with the government of punjab both with regards to raising awareness mobilizing the community to in this regard so when it comes to talking about the current trends of dengue in the province of punjab what are the current stats on the same first of all uh, i would like to tell you that currently uh, this year hmm. we have almost uh, 1796 confirmed cases hmm. cases up till now hmm. uh, number 1 is lahore hmm. uh, with more than uh, 500 cases number 2 is rawalpindi hmm. number 3 is uh, multan number 4 is faisalabad hmm. number 5 is shekhupura number 6 is gujranwala Right. For the last five years, we have seen that trend, hmm. and these six mega cities are mostly affected by the dengue. Why so, sir? Uh, because uh, of the urbanization, hmm. because of the congested homes, because of more vector in these areas, and also climatic changes. and climatic early changes. Yes. Because the uh, global phenomena hmm. of the climatic changes, uh, hmm. because as we saw. early monsoon this year exactly. in exactly even last year till sir. now hmm. yes even last year hmm. the worst flood we saw exactly and uh, up till now more than 1100 mm uh, rain has been recorded in just lahore uh, definitely you can see where is the collection of the water there are the chances of right. more more uh, vector Uh, for Bond the diseases, basically, especially disease. like that of dengue. Yeah. Sir, in this regard, you raised a very valid point on which I would want you to deliberate further. Uh, climatic changes, as we all understand, they have contributed to this increased burden of dengue. But then the question is that how well adaptive are our strategies so as to better adjust to these climatic changes? Because this is something which is here to stay. Just to tell you the uh, brief analysis of the world situation, hmm. dengue. a uh, has turned to be a pandemic disease mm. it has we have seen more than 142 countries mm. which have uh, reported that dengue mm. just i will give you three current examples right number 1 bangladesh at the moment is passing through the worst epidemic mm. uh, there till now mm. more than 1 lakh patient have been reported and more than 650 deaths have occurred second is the example of sri lankans Uh, which came in 2011 to teach us mm. you remember uh, that is the most tropical area uh, up till now they have faced uh, they have got more than 60000 right. patients mm. and more than 40 deaths mm. third is the example of india india uh, more than 38000 positive cases mm. and more than 38 deaths mm. as compared with all these statistics alhamdulillah in punjab hmm. we have adopted a very aggressive policy right. and 1800 cases are just nothing in the population of 140 million right sir but then these are the stats that we have now because uh, uh, this is and uh, these are the reported cases sir another these thing these are the reported there might be so many cases there out be, there which yes. might actually not be reported or they might not be properly diagnosed yes. like we just discussed because you see diagnosis here is also an issue we are not looking at is that 80% of dengue cases actually are asymptomatic so yes. these exactly. people could be just sitting at home running right. a fever and getting better right and also and they wouldn't be knowing that they are suffering from yes, dengue yes and 
yeah. also out of the 80 percent that are affected or even 100 percent that are affected about 80 to 90 percent also have a mild form of a disease hmm. but then when it's extrapolated onto the population the number becomes bigger of the complicated cases. exactly so there are so many then so dynamics the burden of disease, the, burden yeah. of the disease yeah. that in itself grows basically yeah. madam on which i'll take you on board hey we must talk about your work more particularly the work of your institute of public health a pivotal role of which also includes ensuring that we have proper research in place of educating the public at large so in this regard could you share some important research findings that your institute has actually undertaken uh, which in turn have actually impacted policy and law making so as to control dengue institute of public health it is basically an academic and research institute mm -hmm. so research is mandatory for all the students as well as for the faculty members presently there are a number of researches related to dengue which are underway in IPH one of them is serological evidence of dengue and its association with disease severity how severe the disease is and how much are the antibodies so this association is being explored second is efficacy of BTI now BTI is a new type of biological larvicidal agent and it reduces and controls the larval population and our research is to check the efficacy of BTI at the same time to see that how long it is effective. Yeah. The number of associated factors which are associated with the number of aspects of dengue, they are also underway in IPH. Right, madam. Sir, I'll come to you and I would want you to comment on this further, more so from the perspective of the law that we do have in place with regards to controlling dengue in Punjab. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as You're you welcome. know that uh, for the controlling, since the worst epidemic we saw in 2011, mm. the government of Punjab have worked very diligently on the dengue and mm. we have made the proper SOPs. We used to re uh, redesign it and refine it. Mm. Just in 2023, we uh, made the new SOPs with the help mm. of 46 departments. Mm. All the departments of Government of Punjab are playing role in it. Right. And we have also formulated the Dengue Regulation Act. Mm. According to the these act, we give uh, the legal powers to our environment inspectors, to our uh, entomologists and other uh, CDC officers mm. who visited. And if first time the dengue larva is positive, mm. they give you a warning. Right. If second time the dengue larva is positive, then ye, they give you a legal notice. Hmm. And if third time at the same place the dengue larva is positive, hmm. they can launch an FIR and they can uh, right. seal your premises. So I'm very glad then that to set the record straight, you have actually outlined that we do have this law in place, which is at least on paper very progressive, so as to actually help us curb the spread. But when it comes to properly implementing this law, what are the measures that have been taken? Have any measures actually been taken against those who actually violate these provisions? Obviously, we have made the system. For example, I told you two days back, hmm the Kotlakpat Factory Association honours and all the union, they came mm. to our minister. They said uh, that uh, a lot of FIRs and mm. uh, premises have been sealed in our area because mm. of repeated warning. Right. Then we made an SOP. We asked them, you nominate one of your officer right. uh, to whom first we will give training. Mm. Secondly, our teams will visit with them. Mm. So, transparency of the law must be meant. Right, sir. To which you wanted to add something because I am sure you have been working uh, with the Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine and you would have your own narrative to add here. How important it is then not only to ensure implementation of such laws but also to make the community at large aware about the disease. So, I feel Fatma definitely it is very important that now we have the regulatory acts and now people need to be pushed into a corner to be doing and taking measures but mm. I feel that as far as health education is concerned, we mm. can't emphasize it mm. uh, enough because mm. people need to be more made more aware and more mm. conscious of their surroundings. And I have to state that household owners and you know people residing in societies and communities, they mm. need to come forward and they need to put the effort right. to really you know combat it to really combat yeah. it. But when we talk about taking the relevant measures, you know, be it something as simple as just perhaps covering your water tanks or ensuring that the sanitation is proper, the waste is properly managed. These things are very simple things, but they go a long way so as to ensure that we have a dengue free society. Absolutely. On average, how 
uh, cognizant how aware do you find an average pakistani to be when it comes to uh, knowing about the disease when it comes to fighting of the same when it comes to even for that matter you know working towards its prevention i as as a, as pakistani people i think we are very resilient hmm. so i think that we sort of become too comfortable with whatever is happening around hmm. us hmm. so back when the epidemic started people hmm. were very more aware they were hmm. taking all the measures and they were hmm. being very careful but as the times have passed and people have learned more about dengue and you know they've realized that it's just a viral illness hmm. with little bit of potential you know to become complicated i think they've become more relaxed so that hmm. is what we need to work at and hmm. even at the society this is what we do we keep pushing the agenda keep telling people mm. keep making them more aware that right. yes it's something very common and it can turn into something very catastrophic at the Bilko. same time right so exactly. the measures need to be continued right yeah. so it needs to be sustained engagement yeah. and here at least i feel the media has a very important role yeah. to play uh, on which i'll come to you madam and here another question that i would want to put to you in continuation to what we are talking about today is the fact that when we talk about ensuring that public health care professionals they are sensitized they are trained about the disease itself uh, do you feel that this is something that has been done because we do understand that tackling link this very disease does come with its own set of unique challenges too yes of course we are involved in the training of the entomologists entomologists they are the peak players in uh, control of dengue they are the ones who go in the field and uh, uh, and are responsible for devising new strategies for the control of the vector which is mosquito hmm. so not only their um, curriculum that is being devised over that is developed in ips but also they are trained here that even our entomologists and our head of the entomology department he goes in the fields and do, does the third party validation finds out where the gaps in the implementation of sops is and then rectify them right madam sir on which i'll take you on board hey we must talk about the software that you have launched in this regard to working with the government of punjab the aim of which is to make the average person out there more aware about dengue what the disease is about and how to identify the symptoms so how does this software practically work and does it in any way also facilitate a person's access to the healthcare system because there might be people out there who might not be able to rush to the hospitals immediately uh thank you very much for this welcome. this is very important question people must know that uh, after the worst epidemic in 2011 mm. we have worked collaboratively very closely with the punjab information board of technology mm. and we have made a dashboard this is a paperless program mm. we have made two dashboard one for the vector surveillance mm. uh, for the larva identification for the and one for the disease mm. Uh, so we have two dashboard for the dengue hmm. we have given the we have given the trainings uh, with the help of diag dengue right. expert advisory group and uh, it gave a uh, training to all the doctors how to treat the dengue patients because right. there is no need of uh, panic and uh, platelets hmm. giving them uh, there is no need of over fluid them hmm. uh, there are some sops we have uh, co continuously revise it hmm. according to the international guidelines hmm. so on this we have given login and password to all the government sector hospitals hmm. teaching hospital tehsil headquarters the district headquarters hmm. hospital and to all the private hospitals right and we also have given access to the general practitioners hmm. on a mobile app so right. they can uh, tell us about any suspected probable or confirmed dengue right patient. but in this regard i also remember that in philippines they've also initiated this very interesting campaign where every day at 4 o'clock people are actually reminded so as to ensure their water tanks they are not left uncovered so as to not allow the mosquitoes to breed there so why can we not have such similar initiatives a very intelligent and a very interesting way to engage the community mm -hmm. so as to work towards having a dengue free pakistan yeah I think you've raised a very good point. I remember that back in COVID as well. I think UAE had the strategy hmm. where during the curfew times they would go around remind everyone to get home and be inside. Right. Just just something that you know people mobile moving around in the society just hmm. reminding everyone this is the time and to take all those measures that need to be done. Also it's very important that when they're taught about the breeding sites as well. Hmm. I mean inside the concept is that it's outside it's an uncovered water areas but it's also inside the houses mm -hmm. under the tables behind the sofas all of those areas where exactly. the vector can be right. so again 
the thing is the same that you continuously keep reminding them that it's very much present and they need to be more aware of that right in this regard one more thing that i would want you to highlight is a fact when we talk about making people aware it's equally important yeah. that we also focus on debunking all the myths which actually surround this very disease now one very common myth which we do come across is the fact that dengue paps is something which would typically last for 7 to 10 days and after that people are good to go yeah. although we have seen cases and i'm sure you would confirm this yeah. that people have actually suffered severe bleeding they've actually gone through uh, perhaps organ impairments because of dengue yeah. so how do you then educate people this is something which you perhaps shouldn't take that lightly yeah. because today it might be something which perhaps be in the form of fever but tomorrow it could have devastating impact on your health again and i am going to highlight the same thing again definitely when you talk about important risks like bleeding or in organ impairment that can also happen after the febrile phase is over exactly so very much in the 10 12 days also patients are at risk and they're never out of that you know that risk window mm. but when i talk about the long dengue syndrome mm. it's something that has come to our attention of recently that patients who have gone through 10 days or 12 days of dengue illness continue to have lethargy mm. and symptoms like fatigue and low on energy low mm. on mood and sometimes even they've got uh, other problems with their normal functioning of the body as well yeah. and that has a lot of research has, has gone into it abroad as well and i mm. think in pakistan also we've been working on it mm. to study some inflammatory changes that go on in the body that lead to symptoms much after the dengue infection is over as well right. and sometimes in, uh, the symptoms can last up to as long as 6 months even so this is something similar to the covid-19 pandemic yeah. as well yeah. where we saw people actually complaining of long term depression to post the pandemic Absolutely, even yes. months after they had yeah. recovered and there were so many women i remember who actually said that they lost their hair and they had other issues basically we've been labeling it as the long dengue syndrome exactly. or the post fatigue syndrome because mm. it's just taking much longer for these patients to settle down mm. and they do need very advanced testing to be able to label it correctly but definitely the phenomenon is there and it's not to be taken lightly which is why it's always better to work towards you know prevention yeah, rather than working towards the cure yeah. and also right. because there is no antiviral available <laughs> right. still and we do hope and look towards a time where something of that sort could be invented or discovered mm. but for now i think prevention is our only banking method to prevent uh, to control dengue that's very rightly put by ourselves very important for us to make people aware about yeah. the disease and for this we understand why the professionals have a very important role to play but when it comes to making people aware it's equally important that we also debunk all the wrong myths Absolutely. or the myths yeah. so to speak that do exist regarding the disease yeah. itself so in this regard what are the most common myths that you come across and how would you debunk the same okay so i think uh, sir very rightly pointed out first thing first uh, with dengue what we saw earlier on was that over hydration mm. over aggressive transfusions a lot of platelets getting transfused that had its own negative mm. impact on the patients and also led to very serious complications so those are the uh, problems that we've been dealing with all over but i think very recently there's also two more things that have that have come up right one uh people thinking that it's only a 10 day illness and doesn't mm. carry any long term effects mm. but very recent research does show that we have a phenomenon known as a post fatigue syndrome or a long dengue syndrome right where sometimes patients can continue to experience some symptoms mm. even up to as long as 6 months even right so and this is very similar to the covid-19 yeah. anxiety that people complain they have suffered post you know recovering from covid after so many months too yeah. so i'm very glad you've raised this because then it's very important to make people aware about the distinction between general dengue and long and severe dengue yeah. too in that regard on which i'll come to you madam and here we must talk about uh, various rural and urban settings in which we do see this disease arising so when it comes to addressing uh, this disease in these different dynamics how particularly do you feel can that be done and do you not feel then that it's very important to be cognizant of the challenge challenges which may come in one's way because of course the way the disease might impact people in urban cities might perhaps be very different in the way it impacts people in rural areas you know that this is an era of urbanization more and more people they wanted to shift to the cities um, in search of their livelihood and for various other reasons and because of this large mo- movement of people to um to the cities from the rural areas there is a lot of urbanization going on and because of that the trees are cut number of water bodies they are developed lots of construction is going on huge amount of garbage is being produced so all these are the factors which are contributing towards the increase in number of dengue 
So this is one thing. And second thing is there is a lot of difference in health education campaigns in rural areas and in the urban setting. Mm -hmm. Like in the rural areas, people, they are more sensitized in the urban areas, whereas in the rural areas, we mm -hmm. need to include local people in order to sensitize them, in order to educate them. Right. So their local elders and their local lady health workers, they are involved in such sort of campaigns. Adding to what you said, Madam Hare, it's very important then to also talk about the fact that it's very important that we need to ensure that there is proper waste management, there is proper sanitation, uh, so as to ensure that we do not make places breeding ground for mosquitoes. Sir, you would have a narrative to add to this because I do understand that you've also been working on initiatives like these. Actually, uh, dengue is an um, uh, urban area disease hmm. and for the rural area, uh, hmm. it is caused by a uh, Mosquito is the vector. It is a gyp type, female type. Hmm. And uh, for the rural areas, we have another mosquito, Albopictus anopheles, hmm. that causes the malaria. Hmm. So in the rural area, we see more cases of the malaria. And in the urban areas, we see more cases of the dengue. On which I'll come to you, Dr. Saiba, and before we conclude today's show, it's very important then to also talk about the tips that you would want to give to the people out there, especially when it comes to steering clear of dengue, because they say it right when they say that prevention is definitely better than cure. So what are the tips that you would want to give to the people out there, that how is it that they, by making little lifestyle changes, or for that matter, being more cautious, can actually steer clear of this disease? I think, Fatma, it's very important to first identify Definitely the preventive measures would mm. remain the same for all age groups, but it's important to identify some vulnerable groups in the society. Mm. Very elderly people, very young children, and at the same time pregnant females. Uh, those are all at more risk of developing a more severe disease. Also like to highlight over here that patients or people who have already had dengue once, mm. they're also at risk of developing a very severe kind of dengue if they get affected by a different kind or a different serotype as we say. Mm. So also highlighting the point that you're not completely protected from dengue once you've had it. Right. So technically everybody is at risk, but the vulnerable groups, we need to be more careful. Again, in the population, we see a lot of, there's a lot of trend of non-communicable diseases mm. also. Our country is number three for having diabetes mellitus. Mm. Uh, half the population is hypertensive. Right. With ischemic heart disease being yes. on the rise, a mm. lot of people are on blood thinners also. Right. And uh, the blood thinners also work in a way where they affect the platelets and mm. keep the blood thinner than regular people, mm. people who are on aspirin. Mm. So it's very important to create awareness among these people as well that if they've contracted dengue, then they need to be in touch with their cardiologist or their internist Mm. so that their uh, uh, medications can be modified right and so that they don't actually end up developing something very long term yeah. or they it doesn't have a very devastating also bleeding could be a very important bleeding risk. could be a very important yeah. thing here too and also you know, i was reading this research which actually suggested that dengue inevitably if it happens in children or infants it is more aggressive that way yeah. because obviously children don't have that strong an immune system yes. as adults too so that is also something that needs to be given due consideration here. on which i'll come to you sir and before we conclude today's show it's equally important then to also talk about a dengue vaccination. So what is the headway that Pakistan has made in this regard and how would you overall compare it with the rest of the world? This is a very important question for the audience hmm. because uh, dengue has uh, four types, hmm. den 1, den 2, den 3 and den 4. In Pakistan, in Punjab, we have mostly den 2 and 3. Hmm. The main challenge for making a dengue vaccine was hmm. to make such a vaccine which is effective against all the four den types because this virus is continuously mutating and it is changing its shape. Right, sir. So up till now, mm. uh, only one vaccine is launched that is Dengvexia. Mm. It is uh, for the children of the age group of 9 to 16 years, mm. but it has certain limitation. For mm. example, it must be given to a child who has laboratory confirmed one episode of dengue positive case mm. and it has three uh, doses 0 6 and 12 mm. first is given on the zero dose mm. then after six months third one after one year mm. so then he can uh, it it has very limited practical right. approach so other two vaccines are on the pipeline mm. we are ha hoping that in a year because their trial two 
have been completed and now they are on the trial 3 right so, so we I hope, hope that they actually with the next year we will mm -hmm. have more options for the elderly people as well and yes. that is very much needed very because much you see needed. then you are actually missing out a very large population of the country if you don't have those particular because, vaccines because uh, we have well. very limited option available right. in the market right now and that's very much needed at the end of the day because if we don't end up developing these vaccinations then we would be limited in our outreach so as to actually fight off the very same disease right sir but coming towards you and of course moving towards the end of the show my last question to you would be we've generally spoken about the various laws and policies that we do have in place we also spoke about uh, the work of the government in this regard more particularly when it comes to not only prevention but also ensuring that people are aware of this very disease but in this regard particularly what do you feel can the society at large do so as to not only ensure that they are generally more aware about the disease but also to ensure they actually make timely interventions to treat the same too i strongly believe that uh, the present uh, all the uh, government's present strategies and policies they are pretty effective very strong and they are based upon the evidence which is being produced by the on the basis of research but still there are always gaps there is always a need to uh, improve all these uh, strategies and for this purpose these strategies they are being reviewed revised and improved on annual basis every year then another thing is that vaccine is always been a game changer in all sorts of infectious diseases so likewise in dengue though the vaccine it has been developed with the name of dengue vaccia and it is also introduced in some of the countries like mexico was the first one to introduce it mm. introduce it but pakistan is still in the queue of those countries who are still waiting for this uh, vaccine government has been um, striving hard to get this vaccine and we hope that soon it would reach and once it would be here definitely definitely it will be a game changer Uh, right madam on which note i would like to conclude today's show thank you so much doc saiba thank you so much doc saab and thank you so much madam for your time today well to conclude today's show we generally spoke about dengue and of course the way it has impacted the pakistani society at large we also spoke about the factors which unfortunately have led to a greater transmission of the same we also spoke about the law and policies that we do have in place so as to curb this very disease and of course the work of the government in this regard too one thing that we all need to work upon is of course greater community engagement because we definitely cannot fight off this very disease until and unless all of us make a collective effort to do the same thank you for watching the society until next time take care and allah hafiz